if you would like. Early in my ministry with the Navigators, both as a student minister, as a teacher, Navigator contact staff, and then as an area representative, I discovered, as I kept track, I like to keep track of things, find out what's working, what's not working, I discovered about one out of 10 of the students or men I created, I recruited to Bible study, who came to Bible study, would become a disciple maker. I discovered that those who began meeting with me and later on their own, on one-on-one -on -one quiet times alone with God and his word, that 90% of those became disciple makers. So it became an early conviction of mine to, in order to create lasting, reproducing, generational disciples, that we need to get men in the word and in prayer meeting with God. So this is what I have for you. This is a, some sheet, a sheet here on meeting one-on-one -on -one with men with some different skills. Now, as a missionary, my, uh, I would always tell the men on the team who come with me on a mission trip, it's the KISS principle. Keep it spiritually simple. A lot of places I minister at, uh, people will come with a rock to sit on, a pencil, and a torn off piece of paper. We would supply them with Bibles. Many, many of the pastors would be weeping and crying when they received their study Bible. But uh, that, the method I teach them has to be simple. And the simplest form that I know of is called no be do. do. Read the passage. What is something God wants you to know? What is something God wants you to be? What is something God wants you to do? Now on our website, we have, if you look at uh, uh, page three there, we have hundreds of pre-made uh, quiet time devotionals of all different themes that you can print out or you can do form fill on PDF. Yeah. Well, most of the places I minister don't have access to that. You'll also notice that our website is basically monochrome, and that's because the places we minister, if they do have an internet access, access it's very spotty. So we are a uh, resource-driven website. Everything we do is free. Everything we offer is free. So here are the quiet times. So if you, I've all of a sudden... Uh, your beeper went off and something at work or at home or at the office required you to leave right now and you walked out with this, you would have the primary tool to create reproducing generational disciples. Meeting with God. Meeting with God. So, now, early in my disciple-making ministry, I found that... Uh, Disciples made with peer pressure or environment tended not to continue when the environment or peer pressure changed. That makes sense, doesn't it? So what I wanted to do was move to have a model for the men in my ministry and the students in my ministry. I haven't been on navigator staff for since 2000, so that's 23 years. But um, that they could use, and I still use this model, to ensure that their disciples, when transplanted, would continue bearing fruit. Okay? Uh, where's Bill Robeson? Bill, Bill. I thought he was here. He, has a great, he had a great quote. Uh, no roots, no shoot, no fruit. <coughs> From his workshop. Because the guys in my small group were all quoting that to me from 2 Timothy 3.16. Bill is a wonderful teacher. If you're going to have a Bible conference and you wanted someone to teach on practical discipleship for the businessmen, I would say get Bill Roberson. If you want to have a Bible conference and teach people how to witness in the marketplace, 
I would say, get John Wilson. So Bill Roberson, John Wilson, that's free. That's free. No charge for that. Okay. So what we want to do is take a plant and transplant it so it will thrive no, wet, no matter where it is put. Isn't that right? So the goal is not to put uh, a navigator shield over the entire world. Uh, navigators are facilitators, disciple makers, and equippers to help other people be successful. So we want them, no matter what church, no matter what village they find themselves in. Find this very effective in Nigeria. Every university student in Nigeria has to serve two years somewhere for free and to pay back the university for his education. All he gets is uh, housing and food. Well, they almost always end up out in the village teaching at little schools. You can have an MD, you can have an engineering degree, it doesn't matter. Well, we want those guys to thrive, don't we? The goal is not survival, isn't it? The goal in child raising is not that some of our children receive Christ. I mean, that's the Walmart goal. You know, plant some trees, you go out to Walmart, you buy four trees, they're really cheap. You hope one or two live. You feel like you're at the head of the game, aren't you? But that in the golden child raising is that all our children become disciple-making leaders. Well, that's the goal in our ministry, isn't it? Not that our fruit survives, but our fruit are become disciple-making leaders. So, what's a model we can build like that? Well, let's begin. Let's begin by turning to Mark, shall we? Let's turn in our copy of the Holy Scriptures to Mark. And here we are at the parable of the sower. So, Mark 4, 14. This is where it's going to begin. Okay? So this is where we're going if you're taking notes. If you're not taking notes, you're taking pictures. Boy, you're way ahead of the game. Just keep snapping away. Okay, Mark 4.14. Uh, let's see, who would like to read that? Now, I tell my seminary students, uh, uh, I am uh, ordained both in the Baptist Church and in the Presbyterian, Reformed Presbyterian Church. So when I ask questions and uh, to my students, the first thing I ask is, as a Baptist, who would like to read? If, because Baptists believe in free will, right? If no one says anything, I become a Presbyterian. Of course, Presbyterians believe in predestination. So, now then we find out who is predestined to read. So, <laughs> since there are no Baptists here, Cameron, oh, no. would you read? <laughs> you see, he who hesitates is lost. <laughs> Cameron, would you stand and read from God's Word, Mark 4, 14? Just the one verse? Please. The sower sows the Word. Okay, so, I'm in my Sunday school class. Somebody says, you know, I'm filling up my gas tank, and uh, I ended up talking to the person next to me, and... I was able to, to just sow a little in their life. I said, really, what verse did you share with them? Because, you know, John 5, 24, if you're only going to share one verse, that's my go-to verse. Well, I didn't share any verses. Then you didn't, you didn't sow. Now, Matthew 5, 16 says, let your light so shine before men, they may see your good works and give glory to God in heaven. Doing good works is good. No one gets saved by them, but they're good. Good, good. This is what I mean. Here, stand up, brother. This is Bruce McDonald. Yeah, turn around. Okay, now from that, you, you really get a picture of uh, sin, death, judgment. Now turn this way. Uh, turn alive. Uh, abundant life. Uh, then, then kind of go like this. Put your hands on your hips there. There you go. You see, that's uh, uh, Christ paid the penalty. Here, believe, receive. Y'all all caught that, right? No, I mean, thank you, brother. Yeah. 
You can email my wife, she will be all over me for doing that. <laughs> That's what happens when I don't bring my wife. So, nobody gets saved by looking at you. People look at me, they're gonna, they may get more lost. The sower sows the what? Word. Words have meaning. The word of God. You sow in people's life with the word. In order to be saved, you must have knowledge. Romans 10, 17. Who would like to read that? Oh, thank you, Chip. Chip belongs to a Reformed Baptist church, so he actually believes in predestination. So, Chip, if you would stand and read Romans 10, 17. Oh, speak up, Romans 10, 17. They all got to hear you, doctor. If you men need a neurologist, Dr. McWilliams is probably one of the most compassionate, committed physicians I've ever met. So uh, faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That's right. So where does faith come? Hearing the word of God. That's right. Not by going to hell and coming back, not by going to heaven and coming back, not by apparitions of Mary or Jesus or anything else. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. It's impossible to be saved without knowledge of the word of God. You need knowledge. Romans 10, 2, Paul said of the Jews, I give them credence for their zeal, but it lacks knowledge. You need knowledge. Knowledge is very important. All the minor prophets have something in common. If you want to read through the minor prophets, read the condemnation of God the Holy Spirit on the priestly class because the people are famished for knowledge, the word of God. 1 Peter 1.23. 1 Peter 1.23. Who would like to read that? Okay, go ahead, stand, brother. You can read. First Peter one twenty three. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. Now read the last verse. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls but the word of the Lord remains forever, and this word is the good news that was preached to you. Yeah, the gospel centered upon the written word of God. People say, well, don't share verses, you'll just confuse people. Do you realize the audacity of saying that God the Holy Spirit confuses people? It's kind of like going to a party and you're going in with your dad, and you know your dad's a famous engineer and he's created a lot of bridges and public works in the city, but no one there knows him. You say, Dad, we're going to this party. I'm going to be talking about all the things you did as if I did them, and I would pretty much appreciate it if you would just stand in the background and not say anything. How's your dad going to feel? Not good. Teach people to share the gospel and you say, but, but don't quote verses. Just talk about yourself. You want to grieve the Holy Spirit? Well on your way. The sower sows the word of God. My ministry stands or falls on the holy, eternal, inerrant, written word of God and the resurrected Christ. What does your stand and fall on? Hopefully it's not gimmicks. So, the sower is going to sow the word of God. Okay, that's what we're going to do. Let's sow. Let's sow like crazy. Okay? Everywhere we go, we're quoting verses, sharing verses, asking people, have I ever told you about the time I met God? But this isn't a witnessing seminar, so we'll move on. Okay? Uh, let's see. Uh, Brother Norvell, now read verse 15, please. You might as well stay open to part four, because I'm going to be picking on you. Okay, great. 
Cameron is the navigator representative, where, Texas A&M? Uh, yes, I yeah. do live there. Okay, yeah, has served the Lord. His uh, mom and dad were in my Sunday school class and in my discipleship class at Spring Memorial Baptist Church. Uh, very godly couple. Very, uh, hearts were burdened for Cameron. And he was in the youth group of that church and praising right into the navigator. So, praise <laughs> God. You were in the Corps of Cadets, too, weren't you? No, I wasn't. No, okay. Right. And what um, verse was it, John? You 15. And these are the ones who are beside the road where the word is sown. And when they hear, immediately Satan comes and takes away the word which has been sown in them. Okay, so some people were witnessing to. And Satan sends these birds. Maybe they're demons or whatever. And grabs it, snatches it, blinds them. Second Corinthians 4, 4. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so that they may not see the glorious light of the gospel. <laughs> so how do we fight back? Verse 5. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord, but ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. So we don't care about that. It's going to happen, right? So what's our response? Keep preaching Jesus. Keep sowing the word. Okay? So we do that some more. And then uh, verse 16 and 17, Brother Cameron. And in a similar way, these are the ones on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no firm root in themselves, but are only temporary. Then when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they fall away. Yeah, and so this is going to happen. Plus, it just follows you around. 2 Timothy 3.12, all who desire to live devotedly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So you're trying to sow the word, and Satan is snatching the word, plus he's following you around, giving you a hard time, plus anybody you know. Well, there's nothing we can do about that, is it? Jesus promised it. It's not a reason to stop. Okay? Let's try another verse. Verse 18 and 19. And others are the ones on whom seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word and the worries of the wor world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Yeah. Satan has two questions. How much and how far? He's asking, I'm going to ask you those questions for the rest of your life. How much do I have to bless you with to preoccupy you so you'll get out of the reproducing ministry? Or how difficult do I have to make your life so that you become bitter and get out of the reproducing ministry? And your whole life is going to go back and forth. How much, how far? How much? How far? How much? How far? And that's our life, and then we go to heaven. So that doesn't bother us. Those are, are the, the constants, right? Those are the constants. How much? How far? Well, let's look at another verse. Verse 20. And those are the ones on whom seed was sown on the good soil. And they hear the word and accept it and bear fruit. Thirty, sixty, and a hundredfold. Ah, so the sun will take fruit and start growing, won't they? Now, we want this guy to grow well. So we want good soil, don't we? Give us good soil. Plow up now the hard ground of our hearts, that your sown word would send <coughs> roots downward and bear fruit upwards. That's what we want, isn't it? I pray that prayer every day before I go up to minister. My heart and the hearts of those through my minister. So these little roots here are going down into good soil. 
What is the good soil for the growing Christian? What is it? Well, this first strata of soil, I call heart for God. And what we want in this disciple is to love Jesus. We don't want peer pressure, guilt, fear. I talked to him about Jesus loves you. God loves you. And we need to love Jesus. Eternal security is part of that. I'll share Romans 5 eight. God shows his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It is too late to do anything to get God to love you. That's what I tell him. It's too late. Train left. You missed that. It's not too late to do things to love Jesus. That's not too late. Uh, Matthew, uh, Sam. Sam, would you stand up, please? Okay. Sam, what uh, have you done today? What have you done this year, since the first of the year, to get your mother to give you birth? <laughs> That's crazy talk, isn't it? Yeah. Is this a crazy question? Uh, how about let's make a list of 10 things you can do in 2024 <laughs> to show your mother you love her? That's not crazy talk, is it? Thanks, Sam. Uh, John, call him Sam. He looks like my son. He's the same age as my son. He loves the Lord like my son. Yeah. I'm still going back to Conroe. You're welcome to drive on to Cypress with Eleanor and I. So I know his, his grandfather and I, Ron Brown, have been accountability partners and prayer partners uh, since the 70s. So, uh, but let's get back on task, shall we? How much, how far, what's the good soil? Loving Jesus. Not getting Jesus to love us. If their motivation is peer pressure when the peers are gone, motivation is gone. If their motivation is certain types of materials, when you get through the series of books, they're through with discipleship. If it's relationships, relationships come and go. If it's environment, environment changes. What we want them to do is to do it because they love Jesus. That's the good soil. John 14, 15. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That's pretty clear, isn't it? John 14, 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. That's pretty clear, isn't it? John 14, 23. And he said to them, If any man loves me, he will keep my word. That's pretty clear. John 14, 24. He who does not love me does not keep my word. John 14, 31. But so that the world may know I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father commands. Here we have the example in the life of Christ. If they love Jesus, they'll do it. It won't matter. So we got to get them loving Jesus. And you do that through the word of God. And through prayer. Loving Jesus on the correct topics. The topic of loving Jesus. There's a guy in my ministry, uh, I'll call him Hezekiah, and he didn't want to witness. He'd do everything, set up chairs in a meeting, prepare his Bible study, do his scripture memory, come to conferences, to be down, right down in front of church every Sunday, do everything. They say, you know, witnessing is just not my thing, John. You know that, I'm not gifted. I, I, it's just not my thing. So I said, that's all right, Bobby. I'm not going to bother you about this anymore. Let's just give it to Jesus. Boy, that's a good deal, isn't it? Yeah. So I said, I'll pray, then you pray. Lord, Bobby wants to tell you something. He just doesn't love you. 
and he's not going to witness. He doesn't love you. He's not going to tell people about your death, burial, and resurrection because he doesn't love you. This has been bothering him, and he just wants to say it out loud. Jesus, I don't love you. Hey, Bobby, you pray. <laughs> I'm not going to pray that prayer. I said, Doctor, you've already prayed that prayer. We're just gonna, let's just say it out loud, okay? Let's just say it out loud. I can't say it out loud. Bobby, we've done this study. John 14, 15, if you love me, you'll come keep my commandments. John 14, 24, if you don't love me, you don't keep my commandments. There it is, buddy. Let's just deal with it. Go ahead, tell him. I can't pray that prayer. Then you only have one other choice. Tell him you don't want to witness, but you'll do it because you love him. So he did. One year later, he was in charge of the witnessing program. Leading people's trust. But you see, I didn't want Bobby to be in the witnessing program. I wanted Bobby to love Jesus. And if he loves Jesus, the, I don't have to drag him kicking and screaming to the quiet timetable, to the Bible study table, to the scripture memory table, to the witnessing table. It all becomes about Jesus. I, I shared that with a Baptist men's group and I could see the men with just their brows were furrowed. And when I got through the first half, they said, boy, I bet you that guy needed counseling. And I said, no, he's in charge of the witnessing program now. He loves Jesus. And no matter how hard it was, he was going to do it because he loved Jesus. So that's where it all starts, man. We start with loving Jesus. And so we start them out in the word and prayer. And then we come up with verses on loving Jesus, loving God, and we do no be you with them. We give them seven. Then we get together and talk about it. And we give them seven more. And we get together and talk about it. And they are spending time alone with God, loving Jesus, and learning what it means to love Jesus in a daily quiet time alone with God. So that's where I start with the reproducing disciple. Now, then, what's the next level I go to? is heart for people. Now, here I've got them in the word and prayer on loving Jesus in their relationship with God. Here I've got them in word, prayer, fellowship, and witnessing to develop their heart for people. That's the next level, heart for people. Now, one way they develop a heart for people is in Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as the day draws near. That's the plus side. On the negative side, I begin working with them in 1 Corinthians 15.33. Do not be deceived, bad company corrupts good morals. So we're encouraging that them to have strong, <coughs> solid Christian relationships. And we're, I'm encouraging them to disengage. Now I know that's heresy. Because what we want to use is our young Christians and our young disciples and the cabin fodder of spiritual warfare to boost our ministry up, even though we lose some. No, there's plenty of pagans out there. I don't have to worry about that. What I'm worried about is a root reproducing disciple maker. So he doesn't alienate himself from his non-Christian friends, but they aren't his buddies. To me, the... Um, Achilles' heel of relational witnessing is 1 Corinthians 15, 33. The Word of God says in relaxed relationships, 
and relax relationships, and you can turn with that uh, to that passage, passage if you want, 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Relaxed relationships descend. Keep an eye on your wife's friends. Keep an eye on your friends. Keep an eye on your children's friends. Keep an eye on your ministry, who their buddies are. Relaxed relationships descend. However, on the other hand, in Luke 640, no disciple is greater than his teacher, but every disciple, when he's fully trained, will be like his teacher. Intentional relationships ascend. Relaxed relationships descend. So the people I have relaxed relationships are people if I ascend, I'll end up better than I am now. I relax around Chip McLaurin. I don't worry about that. I'm not going to be in, end up having swear words in my mind. You know, there's some, you know, he, Chip's not going to, this is my relationship with Chip. Okay, let's play a little poker here. I'll light you a cigar. Here, have, have a beer. Uh, let me tell you a dirty joke. Okay, I'm raising you three. Let's quote some verses. You know that kind of deal, don't you? That's not discipleship. That's bad company corrupting good morals. Don't do that. Ascend. Focused. Training relationships. Ascend. The people who are in your ministry are better and their wives love you, and their children love you, and their neighbors, they like you, just because of the change in this guy's life. That's what we want, isn't it? I tell people I praise God. I grew up in a time when a youth ministers and pastors, when youth and college students aspired to look like their youth ministers and pastors, rather than a day when youth ministers and the pastors aspired to look like children. Don't get me started, Matthew. Don't get me started. Guy shows up to give the weather and he's dressed better than the guy that shows up to preach God's word. So we won't go there. Now, forget that. So what we're going to do, what we are going, what we are going to do here is develop him in the soil of hearts for people. How are we going to do that? Well, he's already in the word and prayer, isn't he? Loving Jesus. Well, let's get him to make a list of 10 people he knows that aren't Christians. And then let's give him Romans 10.1. Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is they might be saved. And we'll get him praying for that. Those 10 people. Let's get him praying for fellowship. Let's give him praying over he Hebrews 10.24 and 25. And then we're going to add here. Stretch your memory now. Memorize some verses. How can I be a better member of my fellowship? You know, you gentlemen uh, with the Navigators have an excellent tool. It's called the uh, Topical Memory System. 60 great verses. That's where we start this. Now he's having a quiet time. He's developing a heart for God. He's praying for the lost. Now let's get him memorizing, memorizing the bridge illustration. Because when he works through your witnessing prayer sheet, he'll hit Romans 10, 17 and 1 Peter 1, 23 and say, boy, what are the Bible verses I need? You came to the right place. And then you start ending up on the road to witnessing using the wheel, the, the bridge illustration. So we've got him praying for the for, for fellowship, we've got him praying uh, for, for the lost, we've got him memorizing scripture, he's still in the word, he's loving Jesus, he's loving people. Now, that's a nice little plan. Okay? And you can actually transplant this just about anywhere you want and it will trug along. But this is a fruitless mulberry. This is a Bradford pear. Boy, when I moved to Oklahoma State, I discovered Bradford pears. They're great. They have beautiful flowers that your wife likes, 
but they don't bear any fruit. So in the fall, you're not out there gagging, getting all this rotted fruit, half eaten by the mice, covered you know, with the wasps and stuff buzzing all around you, because they don't bear any fruit. They're, they're just good, they're just good shade trees to have around. So that's what this guy is. And the problem is, is this barrier right here. And this barrier is called self. And beyond this barrier, this next barrier is the next difficult thing he has to do. Because, here's a great verse. Want to name and claim our life verse? Oh man, you'll love this. This is a promise. 2 Timothy 3, 12. In fact, all who desire to live devotedly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Because he has to break through the barrier of self. Because up here it's been all about him, hasn't it? This next level I call heart for the individual. He has to start sharing Christ and asking God for a man that he can do this to. That means he has to go through this stuff, doesn't he? Satan, the world, the flesh, persecution, distraction, of prosperity, all that stuff. And, and he has to stay focused. And it's a lot easier just to stay up here. He has to be able to say, Jesus, I don't want to witness, but I'm going to do it anyways because I love you. See, that, he can move and he'll still do this. He can. I get mm, once or twice a year, I'll get an email. I used to get letters. People don't write them anymore. I, that doesn't bother me. I get a letter, an email, a text. Somebody say, Facebook post, I tracked you down. I just want you to know I'm still doing it. I love Jesus, and I just want you to, to know that. That's how they get there. We've got to get them loving Jesus. Then we want them to love people. Have a burning heart for people. Not to build up the church, but also to save the lost. So one of the things I do, which is very practical, I have a one month quiet time series that I give guys who are slow starters on witnessing on hell. They just meditate on hell. And I told him, my dad's in hell. 1979, my dad entered hell. His screams began to ascend, and when they hit the crescendo, when a normal person would die, in hell, the person doesn't die. And his screams are min mingled with the cinder and pitch and smoke forever and ever and ever. And I tell people, that's my dad. Now, people, you guys are around or somebody's dad. My dad threw a newspaper when he was a kid. Somebody was a Christian that he threw that newspaper to that when he gave him that tip at Christmas, should have shared the gospel with. My dad's grandparents were Christians. They would take him to church periodically. That Sunday school teacher could have made, could have made a personal visit in his home. My dad was, uh, went to Vanderbilt University, was SAE fraternity. I, I know there were Christians rattling around in there. I was in the First World War, went through officer's training school, landed at Normandy, worked his way to Germany. Uh, among his other medals is the uh, Purple Heart with Oak Leaf Cluster. Instead of receiving Christ, became an alcoholic. Somebody was in there in that. You don't tell me in the 40s there weren't Christians in his units. Came back, got a job as a salesman. The one time I remember him saying this, he went to a sales convention for the Upjohn Company and said, I met one of those guys you, you were telling me about. And, and the man upstairs needs one in like that.
to my knowledge, that's the only man ever shared Christ with him. He was a navigator at a sales convention in California that he ended up at the table with. But that guy, he, he flew. He was on an airplane. That guy you were sitting next to on the airplane, that boy who's uh, uh, filling your paper, that DoorDash deliverer, that kid across the street, that army guy you see in the airport, he's got a uniform on, which means he's going to be deployed. People at work, people at convictions, you students, the university student that God preordained would sit next to you so you could lead him to Christ. They're all somebody's dad or are going to be somebody's dad. Mothers, dads, sons are praying for them. Be the answer to prayer. Be it. Ephesians 2.10. He has created good works beforehand that we should walk in them. Be that person. Leading to Christ. Then what are you going to do? Getting, having a daily quiet time alone with God. Meet with him. Okay? Get your phone out. Okay? Start meeting with him. I can share you a text. Hezekiah, I got it this week. Hezekiah says, you know, we really need to start meeting together again. But uh, Hezekiah uh, was in uh, my Sunday school class. Eleanor was meeting one-on-one -on -one with her husband, with his wife in discipleship. And uh, they were having some problems. So we invited them over to the house. I said, let's do a five-week marriage deal. Help out your marriage. Well, we got halfway through the first 30 minutes. And Hezekiah, he could read a verse, but he couldn't tell you what it meant. Well, that only means one thing, doesn't it? Spiritually blind, Second Corinthians 4, 4. So I said, Let, let's stop. I'd like to share you a, an illustration. So I shared a, a brief illustration based on my testimony, quoted all the verses, and showed it to him. I said, uh, now where would you be? And he looked at me and said, if that's what it means to be a Christian, I am not a Christian. Now here's a guy who sets up chairs in the church, has an affable personality, shells out money, uh, you know, for the men's barbecue guy. He's always there, really easy guy, easy to get along with on his way to hell. So, I said, well, we can solve that problem right now. And we he prayed and received Christ. He was born again, right there in my office in my home. Then they really started to make progress in their marriage. He started having daily quiet time. He said, where can I get more of these? I need more of these. And so I told him about my website. He said, there are hundreds on here. This will keep me busy for a long time. I said, great. He's having quiet times with his children. His marriage is getting better. He's sharing Christ at, at uh, his office. He and his wife were driving about an hour over to this church. They find a nice Baptist church that's 15 minutes away where they can belong to a home group and be built up and have fellowship. I get an occasional phone call from him. And one of the things he said, I was, I was telling, I gave my testimony in church and realized I don't have your name in my Bible. You need to come. I want to come over, get, get it, put my name in your Bible, and then tell me what's the next level on this? Because here he is, our for God, our for people. So said, what's the next level? So, so ne next week he'll come over, I'll sign his Bible, say some nice things in it, and then we'll start again. But he doesn't have to drive across town because... Rather than God transferring me like he did Philip, we have cell phones. We have Zoom. So I can meet with him every morning or once a week or however much he wants right there. So guys, that's what you want to do. After you lead the guy to Christ, you want to meet with him daily until he's chugging away. Then you can change to weekly. So when I meet with the guy, we do the no, be, do. We pray, and we each pray. And I say, pray and ask God to say something to you from his word. And he does. And then after the time in the word, I say, what did God say to you from his word? Now, why do I say that? 
You've got to spend time with God, loving Jesus. It's not about checking the box on a daily quiet time alone with the Lord. Now, I, he needs to have boxes he checks, but, it's, but that's not the end game. The end game is meeting with God. So I want him growing up with the conviction that he can meet alone with God in the Word. God will speak to him from the Word, not some mystical vision, not some listening prayer, not some uh, dream or something, but from the Word of God. Joshua 1 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate upon it day and night, that you might be careful to do according to all that is written in it. Then you will make your way prosperous and have success. So, know, be, and do. That's Joshua 1 8. So that's what we want them to do. So now he's ready to go to the next level. He's going to start praying for his man. So what am I going to say? He's going, where am I going to find him? I'm going to say, where did I find you? Ephesians 2.10. He's out there. Be alert. Well, that's going to be hard to do. Man up. That's what I tell these guys. Man up. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16 Let's turn over to 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13. Okay. Now, I'm not going to embarrass you, if, but uh, who has the an ESV, a New American Standard, or a New King James? One of those translations. Okay? Well, you, which do you have? ESV. Good. Would you read 1 Corinthians 16, 13, please? Yes, sir. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men. Be strong. Man up, guys. Act like men. Now, the NIV is not a gender-neutral Bible. It is a gender-neutered Bible. <laughs> because in the NIV, it says, be strong and skips, act like men. This verse, this word, act like men, and Josomai, is, means man. It means man. My daughter would say, well, I can't relate to that verse. I said, good, sweetheart. <laughs> You're not supposed to relate to this verse. This is a manly verse. Let me show you a neat verse over here in Proverbs 31. Let me show you a good verse over here in Ephesians 5. Let me show you a good verse over here in 1 Peter 3. Let me show you a good verse over here in Titus. These are womanly verses. It will do your children, your wife, and your ministry harm for women to memorize and seek to apply manly verses. Don't do that. Now, Proverbs 31, 28 in the NIV, her children rise up and bless her, her husband also, and he praises her, saying, now they've left that feminine, didn't they? They could have changed that. Their children rise up and bless them. Their children praise them. That would be gender neutral, wouldn't it? But it's not gender neutral. In the NIV, the feminine gender verses are left alone. The masculine gender verses are neutered, like with a bull. You know what neutered means? With a bull. Don't do that. Don't cooperate. There's other reasons not to use the NIV, but this is in a study on Bible translation. Another reason is it, it substitutes the Reformed Protestant correct doctrine of propitiation, which is a Greek word found in uh, 1 John 2, 1 and 2, for instance, with the Roman Catholic Jewish doctrine of atonement. So your NIVs will always say atonement, even though the Greek word for atonement is as different from propitiation as the two English words are. It's not like love, no, this is copy, this is you, no, no. No, two complete doctrines. So, not only is there sloppy scholarship in the NIV, it is gender driven in terms of being needed. So don't do that. So, after we're through here, I will stay around forever and answer questions. That way, Ten years from now, somebody won't say, was that your voice there on that Navigator website? No. <laughs> I thought that, oh, your kids won't say. So, well, we're about to finish here. What's the next level? So here, 
we have heart for an individual. Second Timothy 2.2. Two. The things you have heard from me through many witnesses, this commit to reliable men, able to teach others also. So, you tell him, remember this? Now it's very clear, isn't it? This is very transparent. Doesn't need a workbook, doesn't need a video series, doesn't need anything. All you have to say is, you know, remember this was very, because when we're doing this, I show him this illustration. I say, this is where we're going. Any worthwhile endeavor contains three elements. The big picture, personal sacrifice, incremental evaluation and adjustment. So that's what you're doing with him. You are getting him down here to the heart for the individual. And then the strong, firm roots find their final resting place in a heart for a ministry. Romans eleven twenty nine. Our gifts and our callings are irrevocable, irrevocable. God has a plan for him. Now he can do it. Now you can take this. When you drive around Houston, you'll see these high dollar contractors and they have these big, huge flatbed trucks and they've got these giant scoops that pick up this giant root ball and over the top of this truck, about the size of an 18 wheel, is, is a full grown oak tree. There's a guy in my Sunday school class, works for a company, and they'll drive that out somewhere to some guy who's bought a million dollar house that wants a big tree in there, and they've got a back hole, and they'll dig the hole out, and they'll put that huge tree there, and it'll flourish. That's what we're gonna do here. You can take this tree and put it anywhere you want, and it'll flourish. I've been in this business uh, since 1976. I only know of three men who were team leaders or disciple-making leaders in that period of time who are not still doing this. You know, and it's because we started with, now we're going down this road, guys, but this is loving Jesus and this is not loving Jesus. It's tough, but you gotta man up. Be alert. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. I tell those guys, be strong. Don't act like a bunch of women. Be strong. In that kind of cultural <coughs> reason, we tell people not to act like women, except there are eight different verses in the Bible where God tells us not to act like women. So I never try to set my standards higher than God the Father. No. <laughs> Just a thought. Just thought. So this is what we're going to do. Now we have, when I meet with a guy, I have a diagnostic tool I use called the wheel illustration. And if you went to the wheel illustration workshop, you know that in the wheel illustration, Christ is the center. There are four power transparent spokes called the word, prayer, witnessing, and fellowship. And it's connected with obeying Jesus, John 14, 21. So the wheel, the discipleship is not an altar <coughs> with four standalone legs of that table. And on this altar, you put any belief system you want to. Roman Catholic, Church of Christ, baptismal regeneration, Presbyterian women pastors. You can stick anything you want up there. And as long as, because who else does this? Who else does word prayer witnessing fellowship? Muslims, right? Mormons, right? Jehovah's Witnesses, right? Hindus, right? They all do those. The objective is not to develop four 
freestanding spiritual disciplines. These are spiritual disciplines that we do because we love Jesus and we want to express that love in each area of these disciplines. So King Choate was a uh, missionary to Taiwan. It was my first navigator conference in 1970. And uh, uh, it was in Oklahoma City. Gene Moore had put on this thing for some students. Uh, Walt Hendrickson was the speaker. It was just really thrilling time. And I went to the workshop on the wheel and he shared the principles of the wheel and he said, now draw yours as it is this week. So here is my week, and here's mine. Okay. Here's fellowship, if there were girls. Here's the word, kind of reading the word. Witnessing, only took people to church, couldn't say that, didn't shout. And here's, here is a prayer, all I did was confess my sins and then tell God he wasn't giving me enough stuff. So, then Ken had me draw my wheel and he said, <laughs> now you know why your hot, cold, start, stop, fast, slow, up, down. So that's right. He said, we, we can fix that. And so I use that wheel illustration so the first thing I do when I'm meeting in discipleship, once the guy is uh, having his daily quiet time, I uh, have him do his wheel diagnostic, and then I would say to him, okay, you know, I'll tell you what. First 10 weeks, we're, we're gonna address some of these things, get you chugging along smoothly. And I tell a guy, if, uh, if you meet with me every day, we can knock this out in about a year, year and a half. If you travel or out of town a lot, it's going to be about two years. And uh, Captain Hezekiah took a deep breath. I said, what is it, Captain? He said, well, you know, I kind of started in this, down this road in, in Denver, and I was meeting with this guy, and it suddenly occurred to me, oh, we're like engaged, huh? You know, how am I going to get, am I going to get a divorce to get out of this thing? I said, no, no, you're not marrying me, Rob. Because you get this down. I want you to start meeting with someone else, not me. Okay? And then, once you have successfully done it, I want you to plug in to one of the churches and be their lay disciple-making leader. That's it. And he said, you know, you're the first guy I ever met with that wasn't trying to recruit me to his thing. He's trying to recruit me to my thing. I said, that's right, Rob. Uh, yeah, you're not joining anything and we're not getting engaged. All I want you to be is successful. Leroy Ryan's told me, servanthood is getting excited about making someone else successful. To me, the best example I ever had that in my personal experience was John Crawford. I had many people minister to me, but I didn't know anybody who was more excited about me being successful. Now, John wasn't perfect, but that he did he did have that now. And I appreciate that, and I've tried to, tried to always tell people, what, what I'm concerned about is your success. And my son told me recently, he said, uh, Dad, you know, you weren't perfect. Everything you did wasn't perfect. There were some things, you know, that, we disagreed with at the time, but I'll tell you one thing, me and my sisters, we never doubted that you loved us and you wanted us to be successful. Now, that'll cover a multitude of sins, won't it? Now, these men I'm working with, are, uh, you don't have to ask me, well, how do you balance ministry with family? Because navigators should be the best fathers in the world. Because family is a slice of your ministry. Not all of it, but it's definitely a slice. First Timothy 5 eight. He does not take care of his own family. is worse than an unbeliever. There are not many Bible verses that say a leader is worse than an unbeliever, but that's one of them. 
first thing we find me. So we take care of our family, we take care of our work, we take care of our ministry, whatever that may be. But in every situation, where we want our, we're thinking about success. Matthew 5, 25, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. <coughs> I'm obsessed with Eleanor's success, to love her. Jesus doesn't love the church because of her purity, does he? Think the church is very pure today? But he loves her anyways. Ephesians 6, 3, that it may be well with you and you may you live long on the earth. I was obsessed with my children's success. 2 Corinthians 4, 5, for what we preach is not ourselves, but ourselves as your servants. For Jesus' sake, I'm obsessed with the success of the people to whom I minister. Sowing, sowing, sowing God's holy eternal written word. When it takes word root, heart for God, heart for people, heart for the individual, heart for the ministry, let them go. May God add his blessing to his holy word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.